it's a, a particular pleasure to be able to introduce um, to you Ambassador Kalinda Graybore. Um, and she took up her position as NATO's Assistant Secretary General for Public Diplomacy in um, 2011. Um, having previously served as Croatia's Minister of Foreign Affairs and European Integration, and as Ambassador for Croatia to the United States. Please read the biography in your books um, about um, Kalinda and why she's here, and we're delighted to have you, um, is that um, Kalinda introduced a full-fledged measurement and evaluation program for NATO's public diplomacy unit two years ago. Kalinda. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, very much for that kind in introduction. Yeah, well, my CV might be a bit longer, but I nevertheless feel like a first grader here today, I got to tell you. Um, and this is uh, actually my first public talk about assessments and what we do to NATO. And we did have to sort of boiling it down to a couple of examples, even though I could talk about it um, a lot more. But first of all, of course, good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome. And uh, let me start by thanking Mr. Uh, Legator and Mr. Rockland for having me in, uh, for having invited me to lend a NATO perspective to this truly important forum where I spent a couple of hours so far and I've actually learned so much already and unfortunately I will have to leave right after my speech. I have to go back to Brussels to see my son in his uh, first violin recital so you understand that obviously for a mother it's a very important event to be at. So I apologize uh, that I will not be with you for the rest of the afternoon and tomorrow but uh, my um, very good colleague and um, the the principal person that I rely upon when it comes to assessments in the public diplomacy division, Antonella Cerazino over there, uh, will be with you for the rest uh, of this conference. So thank you, Antonella. So I'll be the first to admit what you've already heard. Uh, NATO is somewhat new to the business of measurement and evaluation. And I have to say that NATO is a bit of a specific organization or uh, an entity in contrast to what we've seen so far, at least this morning. We're not a single government. We are an alliance of 28 sovereign nations who retain their sovereignty in decision making and in everything else. And we uh, take decisions, we function on the principle of consensus, which means obviously that not everybody has to agree, but nobody can disagree. So if we disagree on something, we just keep talking, which is a good thing about it. Uh, but uh, what makes it even more complex is that we're a political, but also a military alliance. So we have the civilian side and the military side. And we are an alliance of values as well. And values are very important and they underline everything what we do. From the values enshrined in the, the principles of our North Atlantic Treaty, democracy, human rights, liberty, etc., to the values of accuracy, transparency, always being truthful, even at the um, cost of speed of reaction sometimes. Um, with the principle that has already been stated today, you know, trust by be but verify is very important in the work that we do. And representing the 28 nations and trying to bring forth their ideas, their decisions is not an easy task. That sometimes is a balancing act and that requires actually a lot of classical diplomacy in talking to everyone, in forging the common messages. And then again, in um, uh, marketing or, or, or putting forward those messages and informing um, the alliance, but also the outside world about NATO and what NATO does. The NATO division that I lead, the Public Diplomacy Division, or PDD, as I will call it, just not to use too many words, has prioritized assessment uh, of our work. The reason why we did it is when I arrived back in July of 2011, I concluded 
that uh, the division basically functioned on autopilot. People were just continuing to do the same old activities that they were used to, just because they felt comfortable about it. And none of them were really useful. So when I asked at the end of that year, a few months before, after I had come, for a, an annual report, what I got was an enumeration of different events, of how many people visited the headquarters, of how many press conferences we held, how many um, conferences we organized, et cetera. And I kept sending that report back, saying, no, I want an analysis of what we've done, of what we've achieved. I don't need just a quantitative, but a qualitative analysis as well. And then I realized that simply there was no capability within the division to do that. So we had to start our work sometime in late 2011, the beginning of 2012, that developed today, I would say, in a quite successful program where assessments have really now become, in spite of the initial, initial um, in, in, uh, um, doubt, perhaps, on behalf of, of some people in the division, and initial resistance to the change, now they are incorporated in everything that we do and they are the basis of what we do. And why is that important? This morning you heard about the uh, UK's information budget, one billion pounds cut into half, which is 500 million pounds. The US Embassy in Kabul, for instance, uh, who do one part of the work that we do, Afghanistan, their budget is $65 million. Our entire budget in the Public Diplomacy Division with 90 people who work there is 10 million euros. And that includes our programming, our travel, uh, running the studios, the NATO Channel TV, our website, uh, the, all the conferences and, and all the activities that we do. So obviously the first rule, especially in times of austerity, was to prioritize. And how do you prioritize? You have to measure, evaluate what you do, and then start working from there. So we have developed tools to measure the impact of our efforts to create, coordinate, and disseminate NATO messages to audiences around the world. But again, we're still learning. We're learning here today, and when we're grateful to Amec and to all of you for having extended so much assistance in our work so far and that we've been able to combine the knowledge that we've gained. So today I'm looking forward to sharing my division's experience with assessment and evaluation, but also again to taking back home with me a lot of um, takeaways, a, a lot of lessons learned from here as well. So again, we started in 2011 when we did not have a measurement and evaluation structure or assessment program. Evaluation of our communication activities was done mostly on an anecdotal basis, uh, except perhaps for our outreach via social media, which actually was the only area where structures and procedures were already in place, but they were really quite rudimentary at the time. Uh, also, again, uh, when I arrived in 2011, we were in the midst of an economic recession uh, in several of the NATO countries, uh, which made our stakeholders, NATO nations, scrutinize every single cent that NATO spends, including on public diplomacy. We needed to prove the value and also the impact of our daily investment in public diplomacy and that our work contributes to achieving the political objectives of the Alliance. And today, I really take it as one of the pillars of the work of the Alliance. Public diplomacy, information, and also partly education that we also administer from the Public Diplomacy Division in uh, some, some of the areas with partners, and particularly in Afghanistan where we're, bringing, where we're bringing broadband internet in order to connect the country, especially the universities, to the world. So I committed then, and I remain committed, to develop the Public Diplomacy Division into a structure worth of our own AAA, please do not confuse with other AAA acronyms, that is accountable, adaptable, and able. Of course, we're, we are accountable to the Secretary General, to the nations for the work that we do, and of course, 
to our citizens, to the taxpayers in our nations ultimately, and the beneficiaries of everything that we do. We are adaptable to be able to thrive in the changing environments that we face and respond quickly and effectively to NATO's evolving political agenda. And you've seen in the last few months and weeks how quickly uh, things can happen and how, uh, how that the only certain thing about the security situation and security is our business basically. The only certain thing uh, in, when it comes to security threats is their uncertainty. Sometimes you think they come out of nowhere. Of course, some of the intelligence services are able to predict them, but they can develop and happen so quickly from what we're seeing today with Russia and Ukraine to international terrorism, to illegal migrations, to, of course, natural disasters, um, even unemployment and the youth bulge, um, especially in the Mediterranean basin, that we need to be adapting continuously, not only in the sense of the methods with which we will be facing these security challenges, but how we will keep our publics aware that security cannot be taken for granted, that you cannot put a price to security, and that you need these security structures which obviously cost money. And that has been one of, one of the areas where we'll, we'll be concentrating in the future as we head towards the summit as well. And of course, it's important that we're able to do what's required of us with the resources that we have, both human and financial, and I gotta tell you that both are shrinking currently. So we've been putting in a lot of effort to regroup, to reprioritize, and um, mostly thinking on our feet um, creating surge across the division, not sticking to your definition of your respective position, but really working across the division in order to be able to assess what is uh, important and what we need to continue to do and what we need to discontinue because we simply do not have the resources to do that. Uh, so as we pursue this AAA in the public diplomacy division, I undertook a major restructuring of the division to make it more effective using our human and financial resources efficiently to maximize impact for the alliance. In short, I removed stovepiping, unnecessary hierarchy, and made it all more of a teamwork effort and made myself and the front office a lot more accessible and also created a core team around me, which is basically just a few people uh, that is founded on three pillars, assessment, strategic communications, and change management. So to start with assessments on the first pillar, my colleagues and I created an assessment team, and the team's task was to help us make sure we understand what works and what doesn't, improving our ability to choose how um, our time is spent and how our resources are allocated. The assessment team is implementing a new way of measuring and evaluating public diplomacy, which by the way is obviously very difficult to measure, but on the basis of, on a framework of measurement and evaluation developed specifically uh, for us by colleagues in the Joint Analysis and Lessons Learned Center in Lisbon, the JALC, as I mentioned in the beginning, we simply did not have the capacity within the division to do that on our own uh, to begin with. So as somebody or a couple of people said today, you start with small, with little, and then you build upon it. And this is what we've been doing. The JALC developed a framework drawn on the base, uh, best practices of many organizations with experience in this area with the purpose of guiding us in delivering the results and the accountability that our stakeholders expect. Second, we upgraded NATO's strategic communication structure. In order to provide better integrated communications across the political and military sides of the alliance. And as I said, we have the civilian and the military side. And those two sides do not always agree in their definitions of strategic communications. Um, two strategic communications, you have the info ops and the psyops that civilians do not do which makes things a little bit complicated for the division. And if NATO does any PSYOPs or info ops, they have to be white, which means they have to be signed by NATO and they can only be truthful and they can only be helpful to the audiences that we're addressing in terms of their um, being able to recognize IEDs, unexploded devices, minefields, et cetera. Uh, the second uh, reason was also to provide guidance to NATO allies 
Every ally is in charge of their own information campaign, but obviously we need to be coordinating and synchronizing, and this is what the process is all about. And of course, to ensure a better flow of information among our leadership, our communicators, our stakeholders, and our audiences. And then thirdly, I created a change management team that works with the strategy and the assessment team to help develop and implement recommended changes, learning from the strategic insights we gain from our assessments, and applying those insights into our daily practices. And one of the important aspects of their work is to gauge the situation within the division and help every member of the team to adjust to change and to identify the needs for potential uh, additional education either on the best practices or on new technologies and capabilities that we need to adapt. Now, I'll acknowledge that these reforms have their detractors. We often hear too much focus on theory and the structure, leaving too little room for the practical benefits. Again, there is also always the innate resistance to change, so typical of organizations such as um, ours. But I can say today that after almost three years in the Public Diplomacy Division, I have come away from our work on assessment more convinced than ever in the advantages that these practical benefits bring. The creation of a structure on measurement and evaluation has dramatically changed the way of our working. We have not only focused on developing metrics to measure our outputs and outcomes, but we have learned to do our work the right way from the very first steps. We have made an effort to develop our activities with the so-called SMART approach. Specific, measurable, achievable, rep repetitive time. So SMART objectives. And not just simply copying and pasting our political declarations. So today, our work is better coordinated and strategically aligned and efforts toward greater accountability are being integrated across the full range of public diplomacy activities. We now even ask for that accountability of our external partners as well. If we're going to co-finance a conference with an organization outside of NATO, we also measure what they do, the impact of that event, the process that leads up to it, how they multiply it, and what is the follow-on process, and of course, what use it is to NATO or security awareness in general. So our work on assessments is extensive and covers the range of activities that we undertake. So for the sake of time, again, and in line with the agenda, I will briefly illustrate a sample of our assessment work in our media monitoring and our social media platforms. First, a few words about media monitoring. Our in-house monitoring and analysis team, and we mostly do that in-house, we outsource very little, they track and assess media coverage in multiple languages. Media monitoring and analysis has been evolving in recent years, keeping pace with developments in the media landscape and technology, and with the strategic priorities of the organization, of course. It helps the NATO spokesperson and other communications, uh, communicators to stay ahead of news developments, to hone their messaging based on evidence, and to assess performance. In this age of instantly breaking news stories in which we watch events unfold in real time, a well-trained media monitoring and al analysis team is essential for quick responses and longer-term strategy in building NATO's messages. Our analysts look at trends in coverage of international political and security issues, and then they compare them against the objectives of NATO's communication strategy. Monitoring and analysis work in synergy. Media monitors report on trends and the pickup of NATO messages, enab enabling the rest of the team to do prompt corrections, rebuttals, and clarifications. Our longer-term analytical reports use a mix of qualitative content analysis and quantitative metrics that give senior management a snapshot of how media coverage of NATO and other relevant issues is evolving. The selection of qualitative and quantitative evidence is based on indicators that remain static, allowing valid comparison over time. Overall, media monitoring has been a vivid daily illustration of the value of assessment as a tool that guides our thinking, our planning, and of course, our day-to-day -day work. 
Now, the other example that I want to talk about is our assessment and monitoring of our social media platforms. As I mentioned before, when I arrived to PDD in 2011, uh, there was already some assessment groundwork being done by our social media team. One reason for this is that assessment data is readily available for social media, more so than for our events, for instance. But another reason was that NATO social media presence was still quite young and not fully deployed. And as a matter of fact, we encountered even resistance on behalf of some of the nations who themselves were not engaging in social media and thought that white NATO should do it. And therefore, it also required evidence to prove why it is useful for NATO. So um, the team found measuring and assessment to be an effective, persuasive way to, be, to build stakeholders um, to support eternally with credible hard data that demonstrated social media as an effective communications tool. Then and now, the social media team circulates quarterly reports tracking performance, reach, number of likes, et cetera, to senior management and NATO allies. And in this way, assessment was adopted from the bottom up, unlike the rest of the public diplomacy division where we actually had to go bottom down. Uh, nevertheless, the way PDD uses assessment and measurement in social media has continued to evolve over the years with constant improvements to the methodology. One of the challenges that we've faced in the social media assessment is the problem of data overload. Mining the data may be easy, but understanding what it means and learning from it is not. So to this end, within the past year, our, our social media team has developed its own version of the AMEC Valid Metrics Framework for Social Community Engagement, uh, which is seen on this slide, um, and which it uses for evaluating the success of individual social media campaigns. This method entails a system of weighing different interactions or engagements, offering a framework for interpreting the data, not only quantitatively, but also qualitatively. While it is essential the team continue to refine its assessment methodology, it is the way in which the team learns and applies the insights gained from it that is really noteworthy. These lessons are applied to inform decision making about strategy, for instance, how we package our content online and shape our messages. Now, simple lessons, such as the fact that more people click images than thumbnails, link, th thumbnail links, have revolutionized the way that we create content on our social media platforms, which also has ramifications of, on our resources. So rather than simply copying and pasting links from other websites, the team has developed a number of templates that enable them to overlay text on eye-catching images using a simplified version of our messages to reach more people than ever before. In addition to using analytical tools to evaluate our social media channels and the performance of our content, we also use monitoring tools to track various keywords to get a sense of the buzz on NATO-related issues. For example, during a high-level event, like a meeting of foreign um, or defense ministers at NATO, we compared keywords that are frequently used in correlation with the word NATO against the message that we were hoping, the messages we would hope would be picked up. If there is a disconnect, we know we either need to shift our messaging to be more in tune with what the public is discussing, or we need to find new ways to make our messages more impactful. Social media monitoring also allows us to be more receptive and more reactive to our audience in terms of messaging. For instance, recently, of course, we observed a peak in the mention of NATO on Twitter and Facebook. And um, well, that buzz was, of course, much related to Ukraine. And we were able to use the platforms as an opportunity to tap into the conversation and inform our audiences about the enduring relationship NATO has with Ukraine. We did this through an information campaign, including did you know facts, like the one that you see on the slide about uh, NATO-Ukraine. 
In another example of this dynamic, uh, we recently identified loads of misinformation online about NATO's relationship with Russia. Our division prepared a rather technical document called Setting the Record Straight to rebut certain assertions we heard frequently in the Russian media because our um, intent intention was not to engage in a propaganda war, but simply to set the record straight. We were able to use social media to make the content more simplified and attractive, and as an avenue for reaching the online audiences we wanted to target. As you can see, the social media team uses analytics not only to assess the effectiveness of PDD's information campaigns, but takes the process a step further and applies the insights gained to communicate with more impact. We also use it as a form of media intelligence, enabling us to shape our messages to tap into existing conversations online, that is, get that necessary information of what people are talking about and how they're thinking in order to be able to enter that discussion. We still have a long way to go, and we are still learning, but we feel confident and reassured by the results we are seeing by implementing this new approach. And I have to tell you that actually we've been asked by the leadership of the Alliance to start applying our methods in other divisions and start working with other divisions to use uh, our management uh, measurement systems at least to the degree that they can. Now, now so I'd like to draw all this together so that I can move on to your questions. Assessments is about changing mindsets. This is what I've learned through experience working in the division. At its best, it entails an organization-wide coordinated approach that informs how we get the job done. And in our division, it informs the organization at multiple levels. It influences staff work to ensure that our efforts are coordinated with our objectives, but it also informs leaders to challenge their thinking on communications. A key element of changing mindsets is to invest into staff training about measurement and evaluation principles and techniques. We have been cooperating actively with AMEC on training our staff on the assessment principles, and we are also regularly organizing various fora and workshops on the latest trends and development in public diplomacy and social media. This training is particularly critical because it ensures that we do things right from the start, applying the strategic insights that we learn from evaluation. To conclude, I'd like to note the assessment pays particularly high dividends at a place like NATO because it demands improvements in two key areas, adaptability and coordination. For organizations like NATO must adapt and must continue adapting to the changing security environment, but also to the changing, uh, constantly changing information environment as well. We need to be thoughtful about our aims and learn from our experience and be nimble through enough to adapt our thinking midstream. Failure to adapt is worse than sitting out completely. The wheels keep spinning, but there's no movement. Only wasted energy and missed opportunities. So we are adapting thanks to the insights that our assessment program has provided. Proper assessment is also crucial because it informs and facilitates our coordination efforts, which cannot be underestimated at a place like NATO where our stakeholders' environment is so complex. As I've already said, 28 sovereign nations, but also over 40 partner nations and organizations, including political and military officials, legislators, and private citizens. The insights that our assessment program generates gives us a platform to coordinate and harmonize our efforts. We all know that assessment is a complex business that can be resource intensive, but in my experience in PDD, I found that it does make a difference in forming our strategic decisions based on hard data rather than basing them solely on our intuition or judgment, which can be clouded by what we think we understand about the status quo. And if sometimes you'd like to check out what that reality looks like from other person's point of view, just take your glasses and put them on your own nose and you'll see how blurred it gets. 
Thus, we need that feedback and we need assessments to do our work properly. Thank you. Great insights there um, into the uh, advances you've made under your leadership. May I invite uh, a first question to uh, Kalinda, down here please, in the front. Hi Kalinda, that was really Thanks. interesting, thank you. Um, thank you. I'm very interested, you talked about training and you talked about um, how you created a restructure that meant insights was embedded and it was part of daily practices. I think that's really important too, So, I, and, and actually I share, we share in government some of the same, some similar challenges. Um, when setting up that team, I wonder what were the skills of the individuals that you were looking for in populating that team? So was it more analytics based? Was it more skills around comms? And did you have to balance sort of NATO specific skills with that? Because that's quite probably a challenge in itself. Uh, it is a huge challenge because um, I took over a division that at the time had about 120 people. And I was uh, also tasked with the reforming of the division, which included cuts in the num number of people. And I have to tell you, it was a very difficult exercise because you ethically have to balance between the interests of the division and the organization and individuals whom you want to preserve their jobs. So I went ahead with, re with the reform that uh, simplified these structures. What I did before the reform, I actually got in touch with every single individual in a couple of different ways. One was we created a questionnaire that was distributed to everyone. And uh, people had a choice whether to fill in the questionnaire about what they do, what they have been doing, what they thought was good about their work, what they would like to do more, what their specific skills were, some skills that we were not aware of, etc., or to talk directly to me. And based on individual evaluation, of people and talking to them and then talking to groups of people within the division across the alliance, we were able to identify people who, you know, I don't come from communications myself. I, I've been a diplomat and, and um, half-time politician uh, all my life. But, you know, you, we, we, the, the most important uh, element, I think, was a desire to do things better, more effective, more efficient desire for change. And then to create that critical mass of people who support you in your change efforts. And then we proceeded. It didn't happen overnight. It took us a couple of months to do that. And of course, we had to get the, uh, the blessing from the private office, etc. And we presented the reform to the nations. So we took into account so many different aspects. Now on education, we'd like to do a lot more. Our budget is very limited. We use online training as well. We train each other. Antonella has been doing a great job working with colleagues, going into particular sections and working from within to develop assessment um, measures. Sometimes they joke about it. You know, sometimes they kid me about assessments. <laughs> But now they've adopted it and they've taken it as part of everything that they do of everyday life. Sure. Please. Yes, um, Joachim von Beust from uh, Oxy Press. Um, I wonder how you come along uh, with decision making with so many uh, different cultures. Extremely interesting. 28, I think. Um, if you. Um, uh, the, the media, the, the reflection of um, uh, is a mirror, actually, what is uh, sent out. So how, how do you come to decision making uh, with all of these different cultures, especially when it comes to crisis, when you do not have time? Yes. Well, it's a very good question. As, and I, as I said, we are an alliance of 28 sovereign nations that keep their sovereignty in everything, including decision making. And we work on the basis of consensus. So sometimes it's not easy, but then, as I said, we keep talking. And then ultimately we do arrive to decisions. Um, we, as international secretariat, are there to serve the nations, to reflect what they've done, what they have concluded. So what we do is we sit in their meetings, we listen into the discussions, we take notes, we compare notes, and out of 
that bulk of information, we take out these joint conclusions. And sometimes, of course, with ministerials and, and summits, it's a little bit easier because you have an actual declarations that set uh, the stage. Then we have our um, strategic concept that was adopted in Lisbon that sets the strategic goals. And based on that, and based on the last summit in Chicago, for, uh, for instance, just to give you an example, we drafted in the uh, Committee for Public Diplomacy, our public diplomacy strategy for 2012-2013 now will be changing it in 2014 because obviously we'll have a new summit. And since we cannot dissipate our effort on every single little thing, we um, define seven major areas on which we want to concentrate. Based on the Chicago summit, that was Afghanistan and operations, partnerships, partnership with Russia, which now is um, an element that <laughs> is um, part of a debate, um, open door and enlargement, uh, the transatlantic bond, and women, peace, and security. Of course, it doesn't mean that we don't, don't talk about other things, but we're focusing our effort not on particular countries or nations, but on these subject area, subject matters, and then we, in that, in that sense, uh, are able to create more synergy. So we've created the so-called PDIPs, Public Diplomacy Implementation Plans, for each of the seven areas where we monitor different activities, where we measure the impact that we've done, uh, and then we channel our efforts into other areas. And then it's also a little bit of classical diplomacy where you talk to nations and tell them, okay, we need you to bring up the issue of, let's say, women, peace, and security, because we believe we need to talk a little bit more about that, maybe in the context of Afghanistan, but also in other areas as well. Or we need to boost our narrative on Afghanistan or our summit narrative, et cetera. So it's, it's a constant conversation between us and the nations who also have representatives on our public diplomacy committee. Mindful of um, our speaker's travel schedule, we've got time for one last question. I have one, if I may. Of course. Um, without putting you on the spot in any way. Um, Alex uh, from um, the UK government spoke this morning about a tender process um, he's going to be um, activating um, this year um, for um, monitoring and analysis um, services. Can you see uh, public diplomacy in a few years' time getting to that point? Because at the moment, as you said, uh, the, the work is done by staff in-house. Perhaps you'll move to that position, question mark? We do outsource a little. Okay. Uh, we do. We, we have a, a whole range of uh, assessment me methods from peer review uh, inside the organization and outside of the organization to actually uh, having companies do surveys and research for us for two different reasons. First, of course, we don't have the human power nor the software, the kind mm -hmm. of software that yep. you need in, in uh, certain types of analysis. And secondly, we've also noted that if you outsource something, uh, a, a project to an outside organization who do that for us, that people tend to be a lot more honest in their responses to them than to us. Uh, yeah. Even when it comes to our NATO parliamentary assembly members, for instance, as, as if they're afraid to tell us to our face yes. what they think about us. They'd rather tell a company what yeah. they think about yeah. us. And of course, the, the, a third element um, is that sometimes with peer review, as, as I said, you know, you've got to put somebody else's glasses on your nose, it's not always easy to distance yourself from your work and look at it objectively and evaluate it objectively. You do need a little help from outside to sort of bring you back to the actual reality and not the reality bubble that you tend to create for yourself sometimes. Right. Thank you. Please join with me in uh, thanking our guests. Thank you.